Hey everyone, thank you for attending today's webinar with Streakwave and Gamma. I am joined by Cameron, where he will be addressing today's topic on do quality cables really matter? I wanted to inform you that this webinar will be recorded and we'll share it on our YouTube channel afterwards. We do love to hear your questions, so please type them in the question and answer section at any time during the presentation and we'll address them at the end. I will now pass it on to Cameron. You may go ahead and begin. Awesome, thank you. Well, I want to um, thank Streakwave, thank Angela, thank the entire Streakwave team for hosting this and having us um, do this today. We love talking about cables. Um, I know that sounds perhaps ridiculous, but it's the truth. We like talking about cables. We like talking about uh, the technology and all these things. So we're excited for this opportunity. Now, if, oh, let me get this going here. There we go. If you don't know anything about Gamma Electronics, we'll give you a very brief introduction. Um, we are in Southern California, about an hour outside of Los Angeles. And so we are in a place called Pomona, California. Um, if you know where the Los Angeles County Fairgrounds are, we are right next to those. So <clears throat> we were founded in 2006. My name is Cameron Lanier. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Gamma. With me today, I have Derek Russell. He's kind of sitting in the back here. Um, he's our RF product engineer. and he is the genius on all of these things, so that's why we bring, we loop him in on all this. Now, with all that said, um, uh, what you probably know Gamma for is our RF weatherproofing products. Um, our cold shrink and our slide locks, which you see here, are AT&T approved. And so I thought it'd be smart for us to at least start where the, the place where you know us best, um, which is, again, our weatherproofing products. So uh, these products have been very successful for us. Um, we've kind of become the go-to name in weatherproofing, RF weatherproofing in the telco world and in the WISP world. And as a result, um, that kind of has led us into other places. So for example, those boots you see there have been growing in popularity because they're so easy to use. They just slide up and over the connector and when you need to get back to the connector, it slides up and back down the cable. So, um, or up over the connector and back down the cable. And so what's really great is um, we have a lot of people come to us and say, you know, I love your boots, love your cold shrink, I love your slide locks. What about pairing these with some cables? And that's kind of what led us to getting into the cable world. And you see here, we have a couple 4310 cables, 4310 being the connectors, and you have boots on one, we have cold shrink on the other, and we kit it all together for you know, our end users, our customers to use. So we've become really well known for our weatherproofing, but also in recent years, we've spent a lot of time and energy learning and trying to be the best we can be at producing and manufacturing cables. Um, so, you know, just like with our weatherproofing product, we want to be the best in the market. We want to do the same with the cables. Even though we're new, newer to the market, we want to be the best that we can possibly be. Now, with that said, I wanna address what we're gonna kind of talk about today in terms of cables. If you are an expert on cables, you're gonna probably already know a lot of this stuff. If you have some knowledge of cables, but you wanna learn some things, maybe terms like PIM and low loss or return loss, then this is a good place for you to be. The other thing is, if you know nothing about cables, we are gonna give you a working knowledge that you, if you wanna go out and be able to feel comfortable talking about cables. That is kind of the goal of today's webinar. And of course, we wanna answer the question, do quality cables really matter? And so that's probably an obvious question. We all probably sit here and go, yeah, of course. But we wanna kind of talk about the why behind that. And what do some cables offer that others do not? Why would you invest in this cable versus that cable? Well, here's some of the topics we're gonna to address today. Um, we're gonna, I'm not going to go through these all right now, but I just want to give you a heads up in case you're looking at it and saying, well, what, what are we really talking about? There's a quick list for you. And to get started, because as you can see, there's a lot to cover. I want to start with the coaxial cable basics. All right. So we're going to be talking only about coaxial cables today. And with that, there are four major components of any coaxial cable that we should discuss. And those four things are, here's a picture of the coaxial cable. The first thing is the inner or center conductor. Next, you have the dielectric, also sometimes referred to as an insulation. Next, you have an outer conductor. 
or shield. And then lastly, we have the jacket. So those are the four major components. You see some terms get mixed and used here and there a little differently, but those are the four major things. Let's talk about what each of them do, however. So first of all, we should start with the inner or the center conductor. That conductor, if you haven't seen the interior of a cable before, you're used to seeing a cable more along the lines of like this with the connector on it, um, you have that inner conductor right there. In the center of the connector, that conductor will go through the cable, it will go into the connector, and it will be the primary carrier of your signal. Um, so it's obviously very important as the primary carrier of your signal. Now, when it does that, it's going to generate a an electromagnetic field around it, and this is going to propagate through the cable. And this is your signal. So the conductor is the primary carrier, but it's also propagating this electromagnetic field, which is going to carry your signal from one part of the cable to the other. And it's going to, um, yeah, it's, it's this electromagnetic field is your signal. And so, there's the electromagnetic field. Again, it's your signal. And the thing is, you don't want that, you want that signal to be maintained very well. And that's the entire point of the outer conductor or the shield. Because what it does is, a little animation there, is we put, if you treat that outer conductor or shield like a shield that's going around the electromagnetic field, it's holding it or containing or enclosing, whatever term you want to use. It's holding that signal in the cable and trying to keep it as strong as possible. The other thing the shield does, however, is it also keeps some of the outside interference out of the cable. Its whole goal is to keep the good stuff in and keep the bad stuff out. So with that said, that electromagnetic field needs space to operate. All right, so it's your signal, you want it to be strong, and that's why we have a dielectric, or sometimes called the insulation. And dielectric is very important for a lot of reasons because A, you need the space in your cable for it to operate in, um, but also you want it to be, uh, to not obstruct or get in the way of your signal as much as possible. So as a result, the best form of a dielectric out there is an air dielectric, as you can see in this cable. So an air dielectric works really, really well because it has virtually no obstruction to the signal. Now you can see there is something in this cable besides just air. You have to hold the center conductor in the center. So that's why you have those plastic spacers there. But you're trying to use, in this cable, we're trying to use as much air as possible so that the electromagnetic field propagates through the cable as easily as possible. Now you might be asking, well, if this is the best form of a dielectric that helps the cable work as smoothly as possible, as seamlessly as possible, why don't you always use an air dielectric? And the reason for that is because these aren't very weather friendly. Um, if you get water into a cable that has an air dielectric, it essentially becomes a hose. And that if you're not unaware, doesn't mix well with electrical components. So an air dielectric, they often see use in indoor applications. They don't always uh, see a ton of use outdoors because of the weather issues surrounding them. That's why you have a dielectric like this one that we use in our cables. This is made of a, our dielectrics, a polyethylene foam. This is also a bit where the term insulation comes from because it's being used to not only create space, but also to help protect against weather. So the polyethylene foam here, it's lightweight, but it also protects against some of the elements like mildew and mold and rocks and bacteria and all those stuff you don't want in your cable. Now, lastly, we have a cable jacket. And the cable jacket, um, you know, it's enclosing the entire cable. It's protecting your hand because these are, you know, metals that, you know, you don't necessarily want to be touching. But also, um, the jacket has some other properties that are hugely, hugely helpful. So, for example, um, most good quality jackets are going to be flame retardant. They're going to be low smoke or halogen free, which makes them more environmentally friendly, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of good qualities that you can and should look for in a cable jacket. Now, the last thing I want to address in talking about coaxial basics 
is the term coaxial. And really it's two words, all right? So first we have the word co and then axis. Co is like cooperate or coordinate. And it refers to the two conductors here, the outer conductor and the inner conductor working together. So co for working together and then axis because they're operating off the same center axis here. So coaxis or coaxial cables. And again, that's the basics of these cables. We're gonna get into some more particulars, but those are the four major components you really need to know because now we're gonna start talking about the difference in a bunch of different types of coaxial cables and what makes some better or worse than others. So let's dive in. Types of coaxial cable. The first type I wanna talk about is a braided shield cable. And you've probably seen these cables before. They're fairly common. Um, it, you may not know them by this name um, because braided shield cables are typically in the telecom and WISP industries, the fixed wireless industries, they're typically referred to as low loss cables. And we'll talk about what low loss means here in a minute if you're unaware or have a vague understanding of it. Uh, a lot of times these are LMR-195 cables, LMR-400 cables, but they're all considered low loss cables. Now these cables, again, have the basic four components to them. So we have our inner conductor, we have a dielectric, we have our outer conductor and a shield here, This and well, let me get there in a minute, and then lastly, we have a jacket. The biggest difference you're gonna notice, and this is gonna be a repeated theme through this webinar, is that the outer conductor is almost always what changes on the cables. And so you, you'll see that here, if I change the angle here, we have a different outer conductor than the earlier example I showed. So for example, you have a braided shield here um, that is acting as an outer conductor and you have a foil just sitting inside of it. And the two of them work together on low loss cables to try to work as that outer conductor and shield that you want to provide optimal results. Now, um, there's pros and cons to how this works, which we'll get into, but what you're trying to do with this is that braided shield and that foil are trying to work together to limit outside interference, and they're trying to reduce loss. All right, so um, they it does an okay job, but for us to really understand it, we should dive into a few terms here. The first term I want to talk about is in, insertion loss. All right, this is a pretty straightforward concept, and you probably are able to piece this together, but just to cover it very quickly, we have a signal in A here, that's it's originating in A, we wanna get it over to B, all right? So you need a cable to accomplish that. Now, in order to get it from A to B, you need the cable, and the signal goes through the cable all the way over to B. All right, now the thing is, the question is how much of the signal is going to actually make it to point B, all right? So let's say A is like your radio and B is an antenna. You are always going to suffer some amount of loss as it goes through the cable. It's just inevitable. And it's not the end of the world. It's something that we've learned to deal with, but insertion, insertion loss is inevitable. It's going to happen. The goal is to minimize that loss and to have as little loss as humanly possible or technically possible. Now, with that said, <clears throat> these cables, braided shield cables, this is what they're designed to do is to minimize the loss. And they do an okay job at it, um, but there are a lot of reasons insertion loss happens and we're gonna dive into a few of them and how these cables kind of deal with some of these issues. So the first reason insertion loss might happen is a longer cable. So shorter cables are gonna suffer more or less loss, longer cables will have more loss. So for example, um, if you took a hose and you connected it to a faucet and it was a 10 foot hose, that hose would probably have no problem getting water through it with good water pressure, et cetera, et cetera. But you take that hose and turn it into a 100 foot hose on the same faucet, the water's gonna have a harder time getting to the end. So as a result, longer cables, they work the exact same way. If you put a five foot cable versus a 50 foot cable in there, you're gonna suffer more loss than the 50 foot cable. Oh, 
Similarly, that got out of order, but that's okay. Um, let me jump to this one. Thinner cables also will um, have more loss. So a 195 cable versus a 400 cable, you're gonna see a different amount of loss. So a lot of times you see people trying to go with thicker cables when they can to try to uh, mitigate that loss. And lastly here, you see the dielectric pipe, which we kind of already touched on, will also impact loss. So for example, the air dielectric will have less loss. Um, and in where cables get longer, where they need really long cables in certain situations, they will try to use air dielectrics um, if, they're can, if they can to minimize that loss, but it's just not always possible, specifically if there's an issue with weather. Now that is insertion loss, all right? Now some of you, if you've been around for a while, you might be looking at this and saying, okay, but what is, I've heard of the, this other term called return loss. And so real quick, we wanna address this one as well, knock out some terms early here. So return loss is similar, um, but it's also, it, it is different. And it, so it goes um, under another term, return loss, but also VSWR or VSWR, you hear people use that term as well. Um, and what this reference is, is while insertion loss is just how much is lost between A and B here, return loss is how much of the signal that gets sent from A over to B will get reflected back. All right, and there's a lot of technical reasons that this might happen. But without diving into all those reasons, um, if the signal originates at point A, you're trying to get it again to point B, um, it's going to bounce back because the system, in order to get the, the signal through perfectly, everything has to be working pretty much perfectly, which is almost never going to happen. All right, so you have to have everything in A, everything in B aligned perfectly with one another and a cable perfectly aligned with all that. And it's just never going to happen where you get the cable or you get the signal through absolutely perfect and seamlessly. You're always going to have some amount of loss. You're always going to have some amount of reflection of a return loss. And so with that reflection, um, it is considered loss because it's not getting to the intended destination. And it's because it's not getting in, you know, it's being reflected back it is another form of loss. So you have return loss and you have insertion loss. And that's why you have low loss cables. The goal is for these cables to limit loss as much as possible. All right, so they, these cables do that fairly well. What they don't do as well is limit outside interference. All right, because these cables sometimes allow a uh, signal to escape from the cable, which is a term we call egress, or they can have gaps in their outer conductor or shield that allow for ingress or interference to come from the outside. And so real quick, I have, I'm gonna throw one more term at you and that's electromagnetic interference. So electromagnetic interference, remember that on this cable, we have an inner conductor carrying the signal. All right, and so that's carrying the signal. And in, in the dielectric, we have an electromagnetic field being propagated. Now with that, okay, these are supposed to work really well, but we have clearly on this cable, a lot of gaps in our outer conductor and shield. And that's gonna allow for that problem where we have egress, where the signal's escaping, and it means outside, outside signals can also work their way in. So we could have ingress problems or interference. So these cables, they have some great pros. They're highly flexible. They're easy to work with. They are low loss and they're less expensive. The problem we have with these cables, braided shield cables, is that, well, they're low loss, but they're not low interference. As I pointed out earlier, this braided shield, it's just not gonna hold up that well. It's going to, if you crimp this cable, if you cut this cable, you're going to see issues uh, start arising. And you can really see it right there around the connector side in particular, where if you cut it to re-terminate, those braids are going to be frayed, they're not gonna go in cohesively, and you're going to have gaps, and you're going to have potential interference and even some loss. And so there's just a higher potential for leakage and interference with 
these braided shield or low loss cables. They're also just not as durable. As you can see here, again, you crimp it, you cut it, you want to re-terminate all of those things. You're, these cables are just going to break down more easily. The braided shield is going to be prone to fraying. And if you've ever worked with foil, which is on the inside of that braided shield, well, foil just tears easily. So even though the two of them work fairly well together, they're just not going to work as well as other cables. So that brings us to talking about, okay, what do some of these other cables do better? Specifically, we're going to talk about low PIM, low loss cables. Now, we're going to talk about PIM a little later on. It's one of the more technical top topics today. So I'm not going to dive into it too much right now. I want to address some of the issues we've already been going over and how low PIM cables address those issues and address them quite well. Now, there are different types of low PIM cables. We have a half inch standard. We have another one we'll get to here in a minute, but we're going to start with this one, which is the half inch standard cable, or it's also called the an, an annular cable at times. And in here, again, I'm going to repeat this theme. We have the inner conductor, we have our dielectric, we have an outer conductor and or shield, and we have our cable jacket. And what you're probably noticing right away is, yeah, the inner conductor looks a little different, but the outer conductor is the largest difference between this and a braided shield cable. And the half inch standard uses what's called a corrugated copper outer conductor. It's very, very effective at what it does. It's going to block out signal, um, outside interference. It's going to keep the electromagnetic field inside very well. And it doesn't require a secondary foil or anything of that nature. It just works incredibly well. That's part of the reason this has become known as the standard cable, by the way. Now, if we compare these two cables, you can see the differences right off. We have the metallic braid with the foil conductor on the low loss cable, and we have a single piece. You know, So just going from a two piece outer conductor to a one piece outer conductor, it makes a significant difference because this, this lower, sorry, I'm trying to get my mouse to show, but it's not showing up. This lower um, half inch standard cable that you just look at the copper on that, it's not gonna have the gaps appear in it the way it will in a metallic braid. A metallic braid, you can have gaps almost right off the bat. All right, now with that, obviously we talked about there would be a higher probability of leakage or interference with the low loss cable. And there's a much lower chance of that happening with the half inch standard. Now, the one thing I will say, the half inch standard is not a very flexible cable. And that is obviously a, a big pro about the low loss cable up there. It's much easier to bend. Now that doesn't mean it can't be bent. All right, so here's a half inch standard or an annular cable and it, you can see it's bending. It's This one's about two and a half feet long. All right, and yeah, it's bending, but it's not the most flexible. You can see that the cable jacket is bunching up in a couple of spots, maybe because it's starting to bend a little too much. Um, and if you do bend it too far, you could break the outer conductor, but you might, you're gonna have to bend it fairly far for that to happen. Now, here's an example of that. So we bent this one to, to showcase this, and you can see there's the break in the outer conductor there at the bottom. And yeah, you do this, you're gonna have problems like you do with the um, low loss cable where you could have outside interference causing problems, and you of course also have your signal leaking out of the cable. So here's another image, a different view on that. And you can see in the top, there's that break. And we flipped it around to show how the cable bunched up on the other side of the brake, um, opposite of the brake. And the reason that's important is again, a hose is a good analogy or comparison for most, if not all cables. Um, because just like you put a kink in a hose, if you put a kink in a cable, well, you're gonna have problems with the signal getting through. And so that is part of the problem. Even though half inch standard cables work incredibly well, that is one of the problems you could potentially run into um, if you try to bend them and bend them a little too far. Now to address that issue, another type of cable was created called the half inch superflex. And this is also a low PIM, low loss cable. And it just approaches the same thing a little differently. So it's got the inner and outer conductor, the jacket, um, the dielectric, but the, again, the big difference 
is that outer conductor, that shield. And what's really, really different about this outer conductor or shield is that it is made of a spiraled copper. So it's also uh, at times called helical or helix. You see all these terms used throughout the industry, but it's a spiraled copper. And this spiraled copper makes it far, far more flexible and easier to work with. And here's an image. You can see we're pushing both of these cables about as far as they can go. So the super flex you can see just bends far further than this, the half inch standard will. Now, one of the things is the standard, obviously you could get a longer cable and that's what people do at times is they'll get a longer cable um, to try to get more flexibility out of it. But the longer the cable you get, um, you have more loss. So super flex is a better option in a lot of ways for you know shorter distances and just having a more flexible cable. Now you might be asking, well, why isn't super flex the standard then? Like why are people still using half inch standard and why is it at times considered the standard cable? And the simple answer to that is that you have better insertion loss results with a half inch standard. I'm not gonna say they're you know night and day in comparison, but you do get some better loss results on the half inch standard. Um, they are not very flexible though, as we already addressed. The other thing though I should say about the half inch super flex is they do operate in higher frequency ranges than the half inch standard. So that's a plus if that's something you need to do that you're not gonna get with the half inch standard. And obviously they're much more flexible and easy to work with. So you kind of got to determine your use. I mean, if you're going something that's longer length, you might want to look at the half inch standard. But if you need those higher frequency ranges, if you need the flexibility, you're going to probably want to go with the half inch super flex. So a quick recap, because those are the three primary cables that we're going to address. So let's compare them real quick. And that's the low loss cable, which gets good low loss results. I don't want to say great, but pretty good. And they unfortunately don't work as well when it comes to inter outside interference because of that braided shield, that um, outer conductor. Now you have your half inch standard low PIM cable, which again, great in terms of low loss, great in terms of low interference, not very flexible. And then lastly, we have the half inch super flex, which great in terms of low loss, great in terms of low interference, also operates within higher frequencies, but it does have a little more loss than you would see with a half inch standard. So really, really awesome cables. Um, they all have their applications. We are actually seeing less and less people using the low loss cables as time goes on because you, know, you can now buy um, the half inch super flex. You can get it in a quarter inch now as well and which is something you're not, and that's another pro I should have added to this list to be honest, but you're not seeing like a quarter, as many quarter inch standards. You see quarter inch super flex out there. But um, so the quarter inch super flex has become a great option for when people need thinner cables because usually when people are using low loss cables, they need thinner cables or what have you. Now, <clears throat> we've talked a lot about a lot of different principles, but what really matter, matters is, okay, test results. That's how we know for sure if these are delivering the results that they say they will, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to talk about tests and measurements. And we're gonna get a little more technical here because we're just gonna have to, because these are the things you're gonna need to know so you can know you're getting the results you want. So first of all, we need to talk again a little bit about return loss or VSWR or BISWAR. The other thing we're gonna talk about is PIM. And that's gonna be a little more of a loaded topic, but let's start with return loss. All right, return loss, I should um, point out that return loss and VSWR are kind of two, they're the same thing. Um, they're two different approaches to it. So VSWR is just a way of measuring return loss. Um, you can also, return loss also has its own measurement um, in decibels. But usually most test results use VSWR, but it's, it's still return loss. And that's why those terms are often used interchangeably. So VSWR stands for voltage standing wave ratio. 
and it is a ratio, as we'll explain here in a minute, and return loss is measured in decibels. Now, when it comes to return loss, or VSWR or VISWAR, you want, in terms of the ratio, as close to a 1.0 as possible. Now, here's the thing, that's next to impossible. Um, you would have to have a perfect system where everything goes flawlessly for that to happen. And that, what it means is that you would have zero reflection. Um, you'd have absolutely nothing. So it's it, ideal, but you're probably never gonna get that. Many consider 1.5 as acceptable VSWR, all right? So to put that in context, we have two cables that we've been talking about or two types of cables. Our low PIM cables often go from about 1.1 to 1.3, so really great return loss or VSWR results. Likewise, our low loss cables still operate at a good loss. They usually have 1.45 or lower, and it depends. Every cable is going to be a little different, and that's why we actually um, we put the test results with our cables so that you know what the results of that specific cable, what you're going to get out of it. All right, so with that said, that's VSWR, and those are the results you should be looking for. So again, let me go back real quick. You want it under 1.5, if at all possible, um, close as close to one as possible. So your low PIM cables are gonna do that really, really well. Low loss cables will still perform well. They're just not gonna perform as well as low PIM cables in those terms. Now, PIM, this is where things get more complicated. So PIM stands for passive intermodulation. And P passive refers to, it's a very common electronic term. It doesn't require its own power source. Um, or in other words, I, you know, if I put a cable up on a tower, you know, I don't have to plug the cable in, in addition to it already being plugged into an antenna or a radio. It's passive, it'll operate fine without that. Intermodulation. That's a fancy term for frequencies that are mixing. You know, obviously we're dealing with um, radio spectrum and we're dealing with all these, you know, fun RF frequencies and et cetera. And intermodulation is a fun term for when those frequencies mix with one another. Now, if you've ever researched PIM, you've probably come across a chart that looks like this. All right, and this can get very technical and I'm gonna try to keep it as simple as possible while still making Derek happy because he wants me to make sure I cover certain things a certain way. So <laughs> with that said, your primary frequencies here are F1 and F2, all right? And F1 and F2 are what you want going through your cable, going through your system, all right? Now, when those frequencies mix with their own harmonics, they will create noise. So it's easy and I've fallen, oh, I've fallen into this trap where you see those third, fifths and sevenths and it's easy to think those are the harmonics of the primary frequencies, they are not. Now, if any of you are familiar, uh, if you know musical terms or anything like that, obviously you have melody and you have harmony. So melody means, you know, the tune you would whistle, you know, if you're, if someone asks you to, you know, sing a song, you, that's the melody. And the harmony is like the backup singers who are singing the other parts of the song. Okay, so you, in the reason I share that analogy is in PIM, or with these frequencies, we have our primary frequencies, that's like our lead singer, the harmonics are like our backup singers. All right, and we don't, um, if essentially the backup singers start getting, they start getting too loud, then all of a sudden we can start having other noise introduced. And that's what this third, fifth, and seventh is. So here's what you want, those primary frequencies. And if those intermodulate with their, id, with their harmonics, which are not shown on the chart, they create this noise, these off-cute frequencies. And that is what you don't want. You want that noise to disappear. Now you can see the frequencies are still coming through strong, but the noise is now present. And a great way of thinking of this, um, of making a real life comparison, so to speak, is to think of a radio station. 
we've all probably dialed into a radio station and you hear the station nice and loud and clear and you get everything you want. That's very similar to, okay, I have no PIM in my system, then I have a nice clear signal. I'm getting the frequencies I want. However, if you've driven out into the desert, you might still be hearing your radio, um, the radio station you want, but all of a sudden you start to hear noise. You start hearing other stations mixing in. You start hearing static. That is essentially what PIM is doing. It's his you still hear, you're still getting the frequency you want, but you're getting all this other stuff mixed in with it now. All right, and that's because of intermodulation happening in your system. And that intermodulation results in noise that you don't want. Now, what that boils down to is PIM means you have interference, you have noise, um, but you also have things like dropped calls. All right, um, you also have drops in data rates. And Ritsu, if you've heard of them, they're a test and measurement company, and they make PIM testing equipment amongst other things. And they did a study where they found an 18% drop in download speeds when PIM levels increased. All right, and you can see the measurements there. And so when PIM levels increase, you see data download speeds drop. You see dropped calls. You see interference and noise. So we can go into all the particulars about PIM, passive intermodulation. There's a lot, a lot to understand about how it works and all that. I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. But the big story here is PIM is bad. It's going to be bad for your network. It's going to be bad for your system and bad for your customers. So the question then is what causes PIM? The simple answer here is nonlinearities. And that doesn't sound as simple as you probably want or as I would like it to be. But it's nonlinearities. And what that means is let's say you're sending, um, you, you, here's your, your network and you want your signal going through your network in a linear fashion you want it just going as smoothly and not having the path um, shift at all whereas and that's what it looks like right that you get the strong signal if it's moving linearly but if it's moving in a non-linear fashion the path shifts at some point and when that path shifts and it that's essentially intermodulation is happening somewhere in your system and that's where you get these issues. You get these little offshoot frequencies that are going to introduce noise into your system. So what causes nonlinearities? Um, there's a lot of things. The biggest one is ferromagnetic materials. And what that really means is something that's magnetic. All right. Sometimes you'll read articles that say, well, ferrous materials um, cause PIM. And that's mostly true. Ferrous means that something's containing iron, but really it's magnetic materials. Not all ferrous materials are magnetic. So ferromagnetic materials or magnetic materials are usually the largest single problem in that, that results in PIM. So for example, your coaxial cables are made with non-ferromagnetic materials. They're made of copper. There's brass and silver and on the connectors or connectors are very commonly made with those parts and are usually coated with a trimetal alloy. All non-ferromagnetic materials is really what you need to know. All right. And those are all good things because those are good things for PIM. But we have heard horror stories. OK, um, we talked to a PIM expert once who told us about how a tower had um, ferromagnetic material, the tower itself. OK, and so as a result of using low PIM cables and all this stuff, even though all the cables were non ferromagnetic, because the tower had ferromagnetic material, they had PIM problems on that tower. Steel. Yeah, yeah steel. So now you have other causes of PIM and non linearities. All right. And that's why I use the term non linearities, because it would have been nice to say, oh, ferromagnetic. Ferromagnetic materials are what cause PIM, but other things can cause it as well. And things like rust and corrosion, loose connections, dirt. There are quite a few reasons that PIM can exist and create issues for you in your network. All right, and we've gone through a few of them now. So the real question becomes, what do you do about it? How do you solve PIM? And that, the first thing, there's a there's several things you can do, and 
there are a lot of different solutions to different problems out there and it can depend on what you what sort of problem you're having the first largest one is that you need to use low pimp cables you know we talked about the better outer conductors or the shields on these cables as opposed to a low loss cable the low loss cable is not going to do a great job with pimp at all and you just if you want to avoid pimp you want to avoid low loss cables so you're, you're going to want to go with one of these but the other big point is that you want to know the test results. So most cables will tell you the results of the cable that they had when they tested it in the factory. Gamma cables are the same. And this is what that test looks like. And test, PIM testing is hard. Let me tell you, there's a variety of tests that you have to do to even get your PIM score. And here, we're very proud of our PIM testing and the scores we get because what PIM is rated in negative numbers. And it's how low can you go? That's the game that you wanna play with PIM. You want it to be as low as possible. So for example, you can see the white line here on this chart, that's considered the standard of negative 155 DBC. All right, so that's the mark you want to exceed. That doesn't necessarily, by the way, mean that's what you'll get in the field, but you wanna get that from the, the cable in the factory coming out of the factory now our cable you can see here blew that away this cable had a negative 174 dbc all right and in in the middle there at the top of that chart you can see it peaked at negative 173 so it didn't peak much higher so really really stellar cable killing that standard just beating it by a mile which is what you want because you are going to have potential PIM problems when you take that cable out to a tower, when you connect it to a radio, when you connect it to an antenna. And because you're going to have and run into those issues, you want to start with the lowest high, lowest score uh, PIM result you can and the highest quality cable you can to mitigate the issues you have when you go and put it out in the real world. Now, one of the issues that is represented in this testing is, is the cable well made? And a good example of that is the soldering inside the cable. If the cable's not soldered well, that's gonna cause a nonlinearity, and that's going to result in a worse cable uh, pin result. So you can see this cable was well made, it was well soldered, and that will be represented in the PIM results, the test results. Now what we do is we put our results directly onto the cable. So here you can see, you know, here's our company name and a part number and all that kind of stuff. But we also put the score for this cable right on the cable. And that's what we do on all our PIM, all our low PIM cables. So this is negative 169. Again, a stellar, stellar cable that's just crushing that standard of negative 155, which is what you want. Because we've talked to some companies who say they find, you know, negative 120 to be acceptable out in the real world. Well, if you wanna get that kind of result, you're gonna have problems out in the real world, get a cable that's gonna crush that right off the bat. The other thing that you can do to help mitigate PIM is use weatherproofing. It's, and use quality weatherproofing, I should add, because too often we still hear stories of guys using tape and butyl and heat shrink and all these different forms of weatherproofing. Well, if you recall, there are a lot of causes for PIM and nonlinearities like rust and corrosion and loose connections and dirt. And I can tell you that one of the reasons our weatherproofing products have become so successful in the telecom world is because they solve a large amount of these problems. And so, for example, even the loose connections, we have customers like AT&T who love, love our cold shrink because the cold shrink not only has a tight seal around the connection that keeps weather out, but it also helps hold that connector in place. So vibration will loosen a connection over time, which will result in PIM. Well, cold shrink helps solve that problem. So again, that's partially or mainly why our products become so well known is the slide lock and the cold shrink in particular can help lock it down in addition um, so they lock down it from vibra vibration, but they also provide the weatherproofing. The boot does an incredible job too of providing that weather protection that you need. So quality weatherproofing combined with a quality cable are some of the absolute best ways that you can reduce or mitigate PIM. So 
to kind of bring things full circle here, do quality cables really matter? Well, obviously from the start, you probably knew the answer, but the answer is yes. All right. But you have to put it in context and realize that cables carry, again, the lifeblood of your network. So do you have cables you trust? And that is a question you really need to assess and you need to look at and say, okay, do I trust? I, I'm spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on antennas, on radio, on getting stuff out onto a tower, putting up a pop, whatever it might be. Why would you go cheap on your cables when they are literally carrying that signal from one point to another? You need those cables to be quality. You need to be able to trust them. And that's why you need to know this stuff. You need to know about PIM and you need to know about loss. And you need to know that you have results that you can trust. So with that said, here are just a few of the issues we talked about today that can result that can happen when you put a cable out into the field. You're going to stop. We talked about insertion loss, how there's going to be a certain amount of loss. You return loss, how some of that will be reflected. Um, electromagnetic interference and, of course, passive intermodulation. There's a lot of issues that can present themselves while you are trying to put up a network, a quality network. And if you want to mitigate these issues, the best thing you can do right off the bat is buy a quality cable. And of course, you knew this was coming, um, Gamma Electronics, we offer very high quality cables, but we kit them with very high quality weatherproofing. And so to help address those issues. So for here, example is an example, I should say, of some of our cable assemblies. You can see these on Streakway's website. You can see these on our website. And these are just some of the cables we offer. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, you can get a type N to a 4310 or 4310 to a 716 din, et cetera, et cetera. What's obviously become increasingly popular for those of you um, investing in 5G are Next10 cables. But we still, there are applications for low loss. We still make those cables and obviously bulk RF cables. Um, if you are one of those people who's out there making, who terminating your own cables, putting them together, all that kind of stuff. Um, we sell bulk cable for that as well. Now, the thing I will say about that is it can be hard to get you. You really need to know how to solder and put it, the whole cable together to get the best results. But if you know how to do all that stuff, then bulk RF cable could be a great solution for you. Now, the last thing I'll plug here is that we are also um, we do five of our weatherproofing samples for twenty five dollars. So if you want to go to our website, we have a form you can fill out there where you fill out. Um, which five samples you want of our weatherproofing products and we will send you five of them for $25 which is a steal and this is really only for testing and for samples I mean obviously you're allowed to use them however you want but we'll send you five that you can use how you want so that we can prove to you these are the best weatherproofing products in the market so with all of that said I'm going to wrap up by again thanking Streakwave and saying yes quality cables really matter they're going to make it they are going to make a world of difference for your network and we hope you choose the right ones and we hope you give us a shot and that you go to streakwave to give us that opportunity but um, i'll wrap up there if i want to give some time for if there's any questions thanks karen um that's really helpful there is a there is one question that came on right now um they're asking if um the cables have like a warranty yes they do you can see the warranty on our website we usually say about 10 years and um our weatherproofing is also has a um, warranty of about 10 years or for things like our cold shrink we actually say the lifetime of the cable Great, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and based on your experiences, how long has um, a cable lasted for a, a job? Oh man, that's a tough question. I mean, there's so many variables there, but, and it depends what kind of cable you're using. I think if you're using a low PIM cable, you can just put it out there and it, it would have to have good weatherproofing, which I know I'm beating that drum, but it would have to have good weatherproofing in order to really, really last. But if it does, it could last 10 years. I mean, it I ideally could do that. 
like I said, these are materials that you're not supposed to, they're made of materials that aren't going to give you a ton of issues with corrosion and rust and all that kind of stuff and would, uh, would work for years. I guess you got to try it out for yourself, right? So um, looks like all, that's all the questions that we do have. And uh, Cameron, thank you again for your time. Uh, thank you attendees uh, for joining in. Um, like Cameron said, go and test them out for yourself. They have that special five for 25. And obviously you can always um, come to Streetwave's website as uh, we also have a bunch of Gamma products as well. Um, and I think that's all the time that we got. Awesome, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good one. Stay you tuned too. for more Gamma products and promotions from Streetwave. Bye now. That's it, huh?